Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, of course, let me extend my personal birthday wishes to the Deputy Speaker and member for Miko North. I think he knows we're all waiting for that celebration later. So I trust Parliament is well prepared, Mr. Speaker. I also join my colleagues who welcome the presence of the member for Castries South East. We all know what he is going through, and it was really inspiring to see him in Parliament, ensuring that he keeps his commitment to report to the people who gave him the power to be here and to represent them. Of course, Mr. Speaker, later today, I will be attending the celebration of the life of an outstanding Labour Party stalwart, Bianca Alexander, from Castro South, Top of the Mon. <clears throat> She's had a long, distinguished association with the Central Labour Party, having been a platform speaker, canvasser, member of my women's group. So, Mr. Speaker, it is a day when we really have to reflect on you know, our contributions to politics and what it means. And certainly she is somebody who made a contribution that we are all proud of, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to express my support for the estimates presented by the member from Castries East and Prime Minister. I am also pleased to address this debate as the duly elected parliamentary representative for Castries South and Minister of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, Information and Broadcasting. I start by thanking the Almighty for yet another year of service to the people of my constituency and country. I am eternally grateful to my constituents, constituency group, women and youth groups. They have chosen me to represent Castries South a very special constituency. It is the birthplace of the St. Lucia Labour Party and the constituency of our founding leader, Sir George F. L. Charles. It is also the constituency of outstanding leaders such as John Stanley Odlam and His Excellency Dr. Robert K. Lewis. My constituents and groups are my strength. I know, Mr. Speaker, sometimes they are annoyed with me and sometimes even disappointed but we both know that the love is real and deep. I know, Mr. Speaker, of their commitment to the dream that we will transform Castro South, and believe me, we will achieve this dream. Castro South will never be the same again after this tomb of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Never, Mr. Speaker. We promise to make George F. L. Charles, John Orlob, and Robert Lewis proud of our stewardship. I am also grateful, Mr. Speaker, for the support of my permanent secretary and the staff of the ministry. They have been outstanding in their dedication, support, and hard work, and so much so that it inspires me every day to work harder. I am also thankful to the boards, management, and staff of the Citizenship by Investment Program, Invest St. Lucia, Cultural Development Foundation, St. Lucia Tourism Authority, the Community Tourism Agency, and the Events Company of St. Lucia, which all fall under my leadership and oversight. I must single out the board members. These dedicated professionals all give so much of their time and effort to ensure the proper functioning of the agencies which they oversee. Mr. Speaker, the presentation by the member from Castries East on the estimates for the financial year 23-24 was a masterclass, Mr. Speaker. It was. I sat and I listened and I felt proud to be part of this team, to be part of this government under the leadership of Honorable Philip J. Pierre. Mr. Speaker, it was an estimate for the time. It is a reflection of what we need at this present period in our history. And last night when I got home, before I fell asleep, I tried to imagine if we were in opposition and the leader of the opposition had been prime minister and had presented such estimates, how would we have responded to it? How would I want to respond to it? 
And I must tell you, I had an extreme difficulty trying to figure out exactly how would I have attacked these estimates. Because you cannot be vexed and annoyed and criticize raising more revenue than you expected. You cannot be annoyed and, uh, and criticize a government that paid down so much on the debt that has been crippling this country. You cannot criticize a government that has done so much to put the people first with practical programs. You cannot criticize a government that has sought to control and curtail excessive spending. What would you criticize? Just tell me, Mr. Speaker. But I want you to reflect, Mr. Speaker, for a moment on what is the challenge facing this government at this time. The Minister of Finance has three objectives for every decision that he makes in terms of the fiscal and financial management of this country. First of all, he must stabilize the economy. But whilst he's stabilizing the economy, he has to ensure that there is a path of sustained growth and development. So he's stabilizing, but whilst he's stabilizing, he must make sure there is a sustained path of growth. But not just growth, but growth with equity. So it's not just speaking of the economy grew by 12% or 10%, but he must make sure that that growth trickles down and that so many people benefit from it. So there must be growth with development. And at the same time, he must provide immediate short-term relief to the people. So think about that. How do you achieve all three objectives at the same time? Stabilize the economy. That means reducing debt. It means generating a surplus. And one other things, at the same time, make sure there is growth, because you must have growth for the country to prosper. But even in the country getting richer through growth, we must make sure as many people also benefit from it. So that's why you have the MSME, and the youth economy, and the CTA. And then at the same time, we must take care of our people. How can he do that? But what he did in his presentation, in a masterful way, is to show how he's achieving it. We cannot boast we've achieved all of them who excel us, but in his presentation, he showed you how every single one was being achieved. And under the policy statement, we'll examine this in greater detail. This time it was just the figures. And Mr. Speaker, I want to point out, and I'll, you and I have had discussions on this, and maybe the member from Beaufort South, who's very learned on those matters, I still believe we are doing this thing backward. We really have to say what's the policy, the rationale, when it is approved by the House, the technical people put the figures to it, and then we debate the figures. We are debating the figures, but we cannot really debate why we have the figures as they are. We have to debate the figures, approve it, and then after we come and we approve the policy that guided the figures we already approved. You and I have had debates about that over the years, and we've not agreed. Uh, but it's something, I, and I still believe, the English Parliament has it right. You do the policy first and then the figures. Because many times you want to explain why the figures are there, but you have to leave that for the policy debate. But I contrast, Mr. Speaker, what the member from Castries East did with what we got yesterday from the member from Miku South and the leader of the opposition. You must contrast it. And maybe the failings of the member from Miku South must be excused. Maybe. Because I started off by showing you how difficult it would have been to criticize what was presented by the member for Castries East. He had an extremely difficult task. But these are the moments when he has to rise to the occasion and to show his real woof as a leader, Mr. Speaker. And I think he failed miserably. The member from Strozel Saltibus tried in his own way to ask questions, and valid questions, and I'll provide him with some answers today. But rather than the member from Miku South, and leader of the opposition, asking questions and exploring alternatives, he got low, dirty, and in the trenches. That's what he did, Mr. Speaker. He tried his best, Mr. Speaker, to be a drama queen. 
in the hope of attracting attention. Then he tried, Mr. Speaker, to show that he had empathy, hoping that people will believe that he cares. And when none worked, Mr. Speaker, he got disrespectful. And then he finally walked away with his ball because, Mr. Speaker, he was too scared to stay in the chamber and to get a response to all the things that he said. But give me a few minutes, Mr. Speaker, if you may, for me to just reflect on a couple points before I go into the substance of the estimates as it relates to my ministry. The member from Miku South claimed that we don't care because we earn more money from excise tax than we expected. That we did not earn as much as we wanted from the excise tax on petroleum, but overall we earned more than we expected. And that we did not care about people. And he wanted to chastise us, Mr. Speaker, that we don't care about people. And I want you, Mr. Speaker, to just look at our record for the last 18 months. Not an exhaustive look. Just look at some of the things we've done for the last 18 months. Not the continuation of existing programs, but the commencement of new initiatives. And tell me, Mr. Speaker, whether that's a reflection of a government that does not care. One of the first things we did, we got elected July 26. Immediately, Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of the member for Denry North, Mr. Speaker, Minister of Education, we increased the back-to-school support. I cannot speak of a very long period in Parliament, but for my five years in opposition, I can tell you, I got nothing near what I got for my back-to-school program. And I know from some of my other colleagues, they said they had never gotten so much support to assist their constituents to help children go back to school immediately, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And why? Because we knew of the effects of COVID on working people in this country and even the middle class. Even the middle class. Immediately, within weeks, Mr. Speaker, we found the money, Mr. Speaker, to provide support for back to school. Immediately, Mr. Speaker, immediately, the Prime Minister made monies available for us to purchase wood vouchers and to distribute them. And I hope the member from Srozel do get vouchers when, when they are made available, Mr. Speaker. Again. 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 Not enough. I, I, I agree with you, Honorable Member. I don't get enough. I, I must tell you. I, you know, Honorable Member, you are right. I still believe I don't get enough. And I was jealous that Babunu seemed to have gotten more than me. But that's why the story. But Mr. Speaker, immediately, Mr. Speaker, we've Without even earning those excess revenue in excise tax, monies were made available. Then the Minister of Education, the member of Denry North, with the Prime Minister, decided that school fees is an issue that has to be dealt with. And they were right. Too many times parents come to us, children cannot graduate because they owe the school school fees. And that is a problem. And we knew it was COVID. And we knew for a lot of those students, they would not have been able to pay school fees for the last two years. How would they graduate? And immediately, Mr. Speaker, we made sure that all school fees are paid in the public schools. That's for a government that do not care, Mr. Speaker. Then, Mr. Speaker, the price of flour started to rise. First, supply chain issues. And then later on, the war between Ukraine and Russia, the two largest producers of wheat in the world, Ukraine and Russia. And the price of flour started to rise, rise. What did we do? We subsidized it, Mr. Speaker. Subsidized it. And I think the member from Sufres said, presently, $94 on every bag is being subsidized by government. I'm sure I heard that figure. If I'm wrong, I can be corrected. $94 on every bag that is sold, government puts in. Think about it. And we don't care, Mr. Speaker, that we have excess excise tax and we, we are wasting it, Mr. Speaker. Subsidized fuel, Mr. Speaker, when the price was getting so high, 
We tried and we tried to maintain it and we provided the subsidy until it became unsustainable and we had to allow it to shift, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the laptop per child, in all the difficulty that we were facing because of COVID, think about it. How would the children really learn when you're doing virtual learning if they did not have laptops because the laptops had been stopped by the previous government and yes they provided ebooks let's not debate whether they worked or they did not work but they were not really suitable and we got complaints from thousands of parents that it was just not working for them and someday mr speaker our education officials will have to do a study on the effect on covid on the learning of children in this country two lost years mr speaker and if they had laptops, maybe it would have been mitigated. And what did we do? We commenced immediately the program of one laptop per child. And we are a government that do not care. And that the leader of opposition, in his pretense, was so incensed, he almost threw the podium over because he claimed we spent a million dollars on repaying something. I can't remember what it was. And then, Mr. Speaker, when we had provided the laptops, we felt we had to ensure that families that could not have internet had to have internet. And we approached the telecom companies only to find out from them that they had submitted to the previous government proposals for telecommunication services to poor families. And nothing had been done about it. Nothing had been done about it. That had been an outstanding program on the desk of the last government during COVID when poor people needed to have internet for the children to learn. What did we do? We finalized the negotiations and we now have the flow bundle where you can get internet, you can get um, your landline and cable TV for $20 a month. And we are government that do not care, Mr. Speaker. Do not care. The distress fund, Mr. Speaker, immediately we restored the distress fund. From the same person who says we do not care was the one who stood up in this honorable house and said, we should not need a distress fund because people are supposed to insure their plywood homes. Go and find insurance. Now, Mr. Speaker, how do you insure a plywood house? Tell me, really. That's what he said, Mr. Speaker. And he stopped the distress fund, started by the member for Viewfort South. We restored it, Mr. Speaker, because too many poor people needed help after a fire, and they could not get it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 18 months, we've started the one scholarship per household program. And how many scholarships have we given, honorable member? Over 200 scholarships so far has been given by this government. Both Slasper and Slasper and University. In less than 18 months, Mr. Speaker. And you know, it is specific because we are saying this has to go to households where nobody in that household has had a chance to get tertiary education. Think about that, how transformational that is. Families where they have not had anyone who's gone to university to get a degree or to go to tertiary, have any tertiary education, we've given over 200 in less than 18 months. And we don't care. Speaker, we launched a community tourism agency. What is it all about? It's about saying that resort-based tourism cannot be the future of tourism in our country. The future of tourism has to be community-based experiences where the visitors can come into the communities and to spend and enjoy all that St. Lucia has to offer. And we've put in, Mr. Speaker, over $15 million in that program. We are giving loans and grants to people who cannot qualify for financing never before in the history of St. Lucia. And that exists now, and we don't care, Mr. Speaker. We've launched the MSME, Mr. Speaker, a couple of weeks ago under the Ministry of Commerce to make monies available, to make monies available to micro enterprise to help them sustain themselves and to get going, Mr. Speaker. Transformational, all within 18 months, and we don't care, Mr. Speaker. We've launched a youth economy agency. 
I can take my entire hour to speak about the youth economy and what it means to young people in St. Lucia. And we do not care, Mr. Speaker. We don't care. I can speak, Mr. Speaker, about support to the police because we do face challenges in the communities. This did not start in July 2021. But we've given the police support in a short space of time like never before. And we don't care, Mr. Speaker. Increasing subvention to civil society. You were the Prime Minister last year and again this year, restoring the subvention to the National Trust. And we don't care, Mr. Speaker. Think about it. In less than 18 months. But compare that with a member from Miku South. How much money did we pay range? An investor who came to this country to build a hotel ends up leaving with about $30 million. Did he care? Think of what that money could have done. And he contests it's not 30, it's less than 30. But whether it's 30, it's 20, it's 10, it should never have happened. And if you cared, you would make sure it did not happen. Health City Cayman, Mr. Speaker. Health City Cayman, in the middle of COVID, when everybody is concerned about taking care of people who are affected by COVID, you would pay $1 million a month for 24 months to give us consultancy on how to manage a hospital. And you care? $24 million? When we had a local committee managing the transition aided by the French, and you care, Mr. Speaker? The same person who closed the fisheries that have decimated the fisheries sector, Mr. Speaker. Today, fishermen are not even the same. Close Radio St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> and you know what we have done? You can go online now, yes. and Radio St. Lucia has been broadcast right now. Right now. And our plan is, it may not those online same night time prefect. And we're hoping by the estimate, by the policy statement, we will be broadcasting for all of St. Lucia. Hopefully, Mr. Speaker. Somebody who cares will pay out seven million dollars for vaccines without no systems in place as to whether we will even receive the vaccines. <laughs> and my last meeting, I joined the Prime Minister. He was still arguing and fighting for the balance of the money to be paid to St. Lucia. And he cares. He cares. I won't even speak about Carbot and DSH, Mr. Speaker. I won't. Mr. Speaker, I heard him, the member, speak about Julian Alfred, Mr. Speaker. You know, and it's painful, painful. The member from Denry North was crucified. It was claimed how he used the resources of National Lodges Authority. But he was using it to help young people like Julian Alfred. When the United West Party came into power, in 2016, they stopped it, Mr. Speaker. And I know the details because she's a constituent of mine. She doesn't live far from my constituency office. And I'm not going to go into all the details today. Leave that for another time. And I'm sure the member from Denry North can deal with it better. But, Mr. Speaker, he will claim how we say we want to do things for Julian Alfred when we could not even have helped her in university. She has a scholarship in university, and she's still at university. But when she needed it in Jamaica, you cut 150 US dollars a month support for her. Think about that, Mr. Speaker. Can you tell me that you care, Mr. Speaker? Now, Mr. Speaker, the member from Miku South took the estimates yesterday in a very malicious way. He's going through it and pointing out where you're supposed to have strategies and achievements and how it's empty. That means you all did nothing. Mr. Speaker, that's a feature of all estimates. A feature of all estimates. Some ministries give you detailed narratives of all their objectives and all their achievements. And some don't submit it on time. And the estimates are printed and it's not contained. I used to laugh at the last government when I used to go through the estimates and realize some of them are empty. But I'm not going to use that as a substance of my rebuttal to the Minister of Finance. That's the substance. 
Seriously? Come on, let's, let's, let's be real. Let's be real about that. Maybe the member from Sozel can teach him a thing of two. Because you know what the member from Sozel did? He looked at it. He saw an allocation. He saw what the objective was, how many passports would be processed. And he says, but not processed, housing. And he said there must be an error in that. Because if you had spent that amount for this, you could not have done X, Y, and Z. That's more constructive. That's constructive. But that's not what he does. He looks at grants and contributions. And he says, look at tourism. Your grant moved from 12 million to about 23 million. Just wasting money. Yes, yeah, wasting money. But the Prime Minister in his presentation did say that tourism allocation has been increased to 8 million. Events company will get 4 million and a half for jazz. When you add it, it's the exact difference. All he has to do is to go to a page in the estimates. I don't think he even knows how to read the estimates books. I don't think he knows how to read it. Because all he had to do was go to the grants and contribution page. He would see in 2022 to 2023 what was listed, and for this year what's listed. And he would see a difference. Simple. It's not rocket science. You don't have to be an economist or mixed degree, is whatever he is, to be able to do that, Mr. Speaker. It's a simple process. And Mr. Speaker, he speaks about CIP monies being spent on consultancies. And I just wanted to share with you, Mr. Speaker, just a little data about CIP monies and how they were spent. Because, you know, he's saying a lot of things. Just to give you an idea, Mr. Speaker, of CIP monies and how they were spent. Mr. Speaker, for example, if I take you to, I'll give you just the last year, Mr. Speaker. Flower subsidy, $8.9 million. Same person who said we could have used the money to subsidize and chastising, we did not do it. It was done, $8.9 million, Mr. Speaker. Fuel subsidy, $4.97 million. Back pay in December 2022, $6 million. Back pay in March 2023, 11.5 million. And Mr. Speaker, contributed $34 million to debt payment, Mr. Speaker. You know, it doesn't take much, Mr. Speaker, to just ask, ask. But you're accusing and claiming that you used to spend CIP money for projects in St. Lucia. Now, everybody knows that's not true. I'm not saying that monies were used improperly or anything. But I know we used to come to this house over and over. And we all knew that the money was going to deal with recurrent expenditure. So he now comes and accuses us of doing exactly what he was doing. Because there's a saying that evil says what evil does. So he's saying that's what we're doing. Because that's what he used to do. That's what he used to do. But another policy statement will say some more about CIP. Because we're going to take our CIP to an entirely different level. Where it can now start building housing projects. Start building roads. And be used directly to benefit the people of St. Lucia. But I will leave that for the Prime Minister to make the statement and for me to elaborate on it. But Mr. Speaker, let me end on the minister from the member from... Miku South. And this one was hurtful yesterday. Hurtful. And I'll tell you why. When the member from Miku South described a young woman who's an entrepreneur in this country and who purchased lands as a non-entity, who has done nothing in her life, that one is probably the worst statement ever made by the member from Miku South. Yes. Speaker, I don't know if the, the member would Member for Strasel? I don't know if the member would allow me to rise in front of him. Please proceed. Mr. Speaker, when we left Parliament yesterday, I called the leader of the opposition and I indicated to him my discomfort in the expression that has been indicated by the member. And he indicated to me that that was not what he meant. He indicated to me that he meant that that, that the person was a, a, a non-business entity. 
whether or not the, the, the government would want to take it for that, but I should express exactly what he said to me, and um, I, I, I thought it was necessary to indicate that. Because all the, the, the expression was, in my mind, very discomforting to me at the time, and I had to express it. But you know, member from Sozel, member from Sozel, I'll continue my point, but let me just say to you, I admire member, I admire your commitment to your party, to your team, but honorable member, th this does not make sense. It does not make sense. I, I, I know you probably feel you're obligated to say it, but let me just say to you, it does not make sense. Because she being a business entity is nonsensical, Mr. Speaker. He said she was a non-entity who had done nothing in her life as yet. You know, Mr. Speaker, in this honorable house, in this honorable house, we have at least three other persons who were prime ministers or one is a prime minister. In the case of the member from Catrice North, I've known him many years and his commitment to youth and young people. We've spent many hours together working on youth programs, youth projects, and I know his commitment to youth and promoting youth. The present Prime Minister, just by his initiative, the youth economy, tells you about his commitment to young people in this country. The former Prime Minister, Dr. Anthony, Fort South, I have never met anybody I have felt more committed to promoting young people. I can tell you that. Because of the opportunities he gave persons like myself and so many other young people. Three other Prime Ministers all have been committed to promoting youth and the cause of young people. And for the member from Miku South to stand regardless of whether he thought she had not achieved anything in the business world to describe her as a non-entity that has done nothing in her life is disgraceful, is disgusting, and we must decry it, Mr. Speaker. That there's no compromise on this, Mr. Speaker. None. You know, I, uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't even want to quote his ex. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll read exactly what he said. So I want to say this. First of all, Mr. Speaker, to have sold that land to a non-entity, a non-entity, nobody knows her. Who is she? Has she done any work in St. Lucia? Mr. Speaker, this is a young person, a young entrepreneur, a young lady, Mr. Speaker. And of all his comments, jackasses, backing dogs, I think this one is the most disrespectful one, Mr. Speaker. But let me move on, Mr. Speaker, and refer to page 357, subheading 072, Tourism Marketing Services, Mr. Speaker. St. Lucia Tourism Authority has been provided with $8 million, Mr. Speaker, for its up for extra budgetary support for marketing for this financial year. Mr. Speaker, the St. Lucia Tourism Authority was funded via an approved budget under the tourism levy in the amount of 25 million seven hundred thousand in, in estimates for this financial year and a government subvention of five million dollars. So they got a total of 30 million seven hundred thousand. The St. Lucia Tourism Authority anticipates a projection of collection in excess of the approved budget totaling $28 million. In fact, they expect to collect, Mr. Speaker, $2.3 million more, Mr. Speaker. And that clearly states to you that the tourism industry is doing even better than we expected, Mr. Speaker, and earning above the projected amount, Mr. Speaker. So whilst, Mr. Speaker, the thrust of the government is to ensure that the tourism authority is to be dependent on the tourism levy. The government of St. Lucia wishes to broaden the use of the levy. Therefore, the levy will be used, Mr. Speaker, to support tourism development projects, such as the community tourism program. Place specific focus on marketing our creative industry and culture, including the St. Lucia Jazz and Arts Festival, our cultural festivals, and the need for us now to engage in some strategic planning and strategic marketing, Mr. Speaker. And it's for that reason that this government has increased the subvention to $8 million, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
the Tourism Authority, as I said, is recording better than expected results, Mr. Speaker. And one of the reasons why St. Lucia is one of the success stories in the Caribbean is because of what the, pro the authority has done in the last year. It has launched what it called Collection de Pipit, Mr. Speaker, a collection of villas, hotels, beds, Mr. Speaker, Cabaway Crawl, Mr. Speaker, Lucian Links, Mr. Speaker, a number of initiatives to ensure that St. Lucia stays in the, in the forefront, Mr. Speaker. In the policy statement, I will speak a lot more about the numbers and the arrivals. But it was interesting yesterday to hear the member from Miku South say on one hand that the tourism industry is faltering, Mr. Speaker. It's faltering, that we are losing flights. And then the member for um, the senator, former minister of tourism, was on television and said how St. Lucia was you know, losing flights and our tourism industry was in jeopardy, Mr. Speaker. The truth is, truth is, the industry is performing better than we expected. Better than we expected. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we have lost some flights. And again, in the policy statement, I will go into detail. But what is interesting is that with even less seats, we have more people coming in. Wow. Can you imagine that? Less seats. Where we are really suffering, Mr. Speaker, is regional travel. Regional travel. In 2019, we had about 88,000 regional arrivals. Last year, we had just over 35,000 or so. And if we had a kind of regional travel, Mr. Speaker, it would have been so much better for us. So we have lost some flights for true, Mr. Speaker. Those flights were put on, and I can, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, in the policy statement, I'll go into greater detail. Those flights were put on because many countries are not open up yet. And therefore, there was excess capacity from some airlines, and they put on additional flights. And what I noted in the data, because, Mr. Speaker, you know, we would go and do our research. We on this side, we take our business seriously, and we do our research. In all the flights, the flights that were withdrawn, St. Lucia was the last destination to lose it because we had been doing so well. So we have less seats but we have more people coming in. We are earning more money from the levy than we had anticipated. And truth be told, Mr. Speaker, you can see throughout the length and breadth of this country that the tourism industry is not dying in St. Lucia. It is not, Mr. Speaker. And then we were told that FS are too high. And last week, I happened to have been at Roots America, and we met with one airline. And our opening line was, we get too many complaints about you. And the airline asked us, I can tell you it was JetBlue, what's the complaint? We said, well, the FA, everybody's complaining, they can't travel the FA. And the guy opened his, his computer and embarrassed us. He said, after bringing up his file, that March 2023 was the best month ever for JetBlue in St. Lucia. Their load factor was 95%. So he asked us, so who's complaining? Because more people are traveling at those high rates than ever before. Now, it really tells you what's happening in the market. You don't have to be any guru economist to understand what's happening. People are buying the tickets, even at the high rates. So do you expect them to drop their rates? If 95% load factor, why would you drop your rates? You're not 55% load factor. You're 95 so they have no interest in dropping their rates. And they will not bring on an additional flight to now cause their rates to drop. At some point, the numbers will be sufficiently high that they will bring on another flight, but we've not reached that point yet. But Mr. Speaker, in addition to we winning the world's leading honeymoon destination, for the first time ever, we won the Caribbean leading adventure destination. Now, is that the sign of a destination where tourism is faltering? But after having said all the critic, the criticisms, he then says, hmm? he then says, all the high numbers they're boasting of is we that cause it to happen. So on one hand, the industry is suffering, and we're on the decline. 
But yet, the high numbers you all have is because of UWP hard work. But let me just tell you something about statistics, Mr. Speaker. And, I, and, and, and it's something we have to note. In the latter years, the last two years of the Labour Party, that's between 2014, 2016, there was a slight decline in tourism arrivals. And the former minister, Lance Theophilus, was crucified for it. But nobody cared to say that St. Lucia's largest hotel, Club St. Lucia, had closed. Had closed. So you took away 300 rooms out of the room stock. Obviously, your numbers will decrease. Now, the members from the previous government were boasting of the increases from about 2018, but they did not say that Royal Ten had opened and Harbour Club had opened putting in about 400 plus rooms into the room stock. So, but they don't say that. But they will say, oh, under the Labour Party numbers will drop in, and then the UWP all of a sudden numbers are rising. But there is a reason for that. I'm not saying hard work was not done by the Tourism Authority and, and the former minister. I would never say so. But sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes it's a lot more than that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on page 358, Information and Broadcasting, you will see for the procurement of equipment, $100,000, Mr. Speaker. Over the years, Mr. Speaker, the equipment of the GIS has significantly depleted. The ministry is trying now to restock and to upgrade. And Mr. Speaker, I notice you have modern cameras in your chambers. Uh, I'm not sure if it's GIS that provided it, Mr. Speaker, but I know GIS used to be here covering. Um, I see you shaking your head, so I, I suspect Chim Parliament probably paid for it. But Mr. Speaker, you know, GIS really needs some um, upgrade in their, in their stock. The last time it happened was under the previous Labour Party Prime Minister, Dr. Anthony, where the Taiwanese Embassy provided a substantial amount of equipment to GIS to upgrade it. They have already contributed 39,000 US. Uh, this estimates provide another 100,000 US um, to upgrade the GIS, Mr. Speaker. I've already mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that GIS has worked very hard to bring back Radio St. Lucia. We're presently testing it on digital, so we have RSL digital broadcast online now, and once we can get, and re, same here, once we can resolve um, some of the capacity and logistics issues, um, without putting a strain on central government, we will relaunch Radio St. Lucia once again, and St. Lucians will have a Radio St. Lucia they can be proud of, but we'll do it differently this time. Radio St. Lucia, the new Radio St. Lucia, will be a St. Lucia radio station. All the music must be St. Lucia. The programs must be public education. All local content. So if you want to have foreign music, you don't go to Radio St. Lucia. The Radio St. Lucia that will be relaunched will be all local content, Mr. Speaker, and is very heavily focused on public education and the dissemination of information that the public needs to be um, for the orderly operation of our society, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on page 561, um, heading 017, Culture and Creative Industries, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm really proud of the work that we've done in the last year for culture and creative industries, Mr. Speaker. Any solution will tell you they had to have been proud to see what the Cultural Development Foundation and the Ministry did, especially for Emancipation Month. For the first time, this Prime Minister said that he does not want emancipation celebrated the way it has been done in the past, that we have to give it greater prominence. And whereas we used to get about $20,000 a year for emancipation, we got about $200,000 plus for, em for emancipation. And the, the, the CDF and the Events Company of St. Lucia really made me feel good as a St. Lucian to be at the waterfront on August the 1st and to actually witness the parade that took place and the cultural performances that took place to herald in Emancipation Day. We went to Denry South where the first 
heroine was and unveil Petronil, Mr. Speaker, as a champion of the, the, the slave uprisings, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and that meant a lot. Throughout the country, Mr. Speaker, we encourage communities to organize activities to commemorate Emancipation Day in Babono, in Monrepo, you know, in ancillary canneries. Throughout this country, Sufre, we had activities. And I can say to honorable members, this year, August, will be even bigger and better than it was for, for last year, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the La Rose and La Marguerite this last year, in this financial year, was extra special. Extra special. Again, ask any St. Lucian and they will tell you they had never seen so much of a focus given to those events. The La Rose Festival, Mr. Speaker, and some people criticize us saying it should be kept in the community and not be brought down into cash and whatnot. Let me make it ex say to honorable members, the groups themselves said they wanted to be in cash trees. They said they wanted to be in cash trees. And they asked us to repeat it. And there's a reason why. Think about it. There are the traditionalists that will want us to remain in the community and a small group enjoy it and they really are the purists. But there's a new generation rising that want to mainstream the, the, the celebrations. And they believe when they are in castries, in the middle of the workday, and when they parade around castries, they said they felt good to see St. Lucians coming out of the business places, clapping them, waving them, people passing in vehicles, you know, blowing their horns. They felt accepted and they felt appreciated that they would not, and so right. So the solution now is how we can find both. And I have challenged the CDF and them to find a solution where you have both the community celebration, but we also have the national celebrations. So in one year, we can do it in the big population centers, in Castries, in Viewfort, so where the public is in the numbers and can show the appreciation. Now, once we have done it for La Rose, La Margaret said, you have to do it for us too. So we end up having to also do it for La Margaret. But La Margaret was very special last year. We actually had a coronation. And I had never seen a coronation of a La Margaret queen before. And we actually had a coronation at the Grosley Church. And then they went on to their horse-drawn carriage to have a La Margaret dinner. And I'll tell you what was even special about the dinner for me. That some of the hotels actually bought tables so the guests can come and see what a La Margaret dinner was like. And Chef Orlando was the one who did the menu, prepared the food and served in the Grosile Human Resource Center. I had never seen La Margrit in such, you know, splendor, Mr. Speaker. And I know, I must tell you, say vive La Margrit. I almost said that in church during La Rose. <laughs> but I can tell you, and the member from January North, he really started because he had the most groups, certainly in La Rose. I think, and, and also, there's a particular young man who beat that drum so well during the, the festival. It really made us proud to see him, you know, performing. We had never seen such effort being put into the La Rose and the La Margaret. And of course, Creole Heritage Month, what it means to us as St. Lucians. I don't think last year we got it right in all aspects. Um, one community withdrew at a very late stage. I won't say that it is Monrepo, but um, they, 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 they did not stay. And they, there were some issues, Mr. Speaker. And we will try to do it better this year. We don't always get everything right. Um, but the member for Miku North has told me he definitely wants Monrepo this year to be involved, and we will see. It. One of the things I'm very glad about, Mr. Speaker, is how we have worked with all the stakeholders for emancipation day, the religious relationship we've had with the Rastafarian community, you know, the way we've met with the different groups, the way FRC supports and is deeply involved, the La Rose groups, the La Marguerite groups, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, we'll be adding a new activity, Mr. Speaker. From now on, the Prime Minister has said, we must celebrate Labor Day differently, Mr. Speaker. May 1st, May 1st is Workers' Day, and we must celebrate the workers of the country. We have to celebrate the workers of the country. Now, the Prime Minister, I've already said to him, this year we will, we, because of how the budget is done, 
We have in estimates now, policy statement end of April. Monies are not really available until the middle of May. So we will have a challenge how much we can do for May first this year. But I can guarantee you, together with the Department of Labor, that will provide a lot of leadership on this, we are going to have, from next year, the biggest celebration for May Day in the history of St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to look at grants and contributions, Mr. Speaker, where we have a total of $15.7 million for that purpose, Mr. Speaker. Um, and one of the, the, the important allocations for me is for the development of the creative industries. We usually used to get $500,000 a year. It was increased to $750,000. And for me, it's really important to have such monies available. And I'll tell you why quickly, Mr. Speaker. First of all, the small grants program, where we can make monies available to different groups, different organizations, artists that just need some support to put on a creative or cultural event, whether it's for pageantry, publishing a book, uh, theatrical pr production, um, dressmaking, they can apply to the ministry. And I'm appealing to those creatives that need small grants, that this government has made more money available to you, for you to get support, for you to put on your creative expressions. So if you need the support, apply to the ministry and we will assist you. Throughout the communities of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker, we want them to be able um, to, to express themselves and we will be providing the support for this. The National Performance Program, Mr. Speaker, again, will be making monies available to ensure community tourism gets the support. Kabawe Crawl, Mr. Speaker, let me tell you, the Kabawe Crawl is one of the most innovative and creative ideas that we've added to the, um, to the tourism product, Mr. Speaker. So just imagine, you know, that's where people meet, they play dominoes, they, they argue politics, football, cricket, is in the, in the Kabaways. That is a distinct Caribbean, you know, experience. Other countries have it too. In England, they call it the pubs. They don't say rum shops. They say the pub. You go to your pub. Before any football match, you go to your pub so you can ready for your football match or rugby match. We have it as the Cabaway, the rum shops. But that's quintessentially West Indian and St. Lucia. So we now add into it. Member for Castries, it's off. You have 10 minutes left. 10? <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to invoke standing order 3210 to allow the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister an additional 30 minutes within which to complete his presentation. Honorable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the leader of government business and member of Castry South an additional 30 minutes in which to complete his presentation. I now put a question, as many as of that opinion say aye. aye, as many as of a contrary opinion say no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, leave is going okay. to. So Mr. Speaker, I'll try to move quickly because I need to say something about the secrets of Castro South. So I'll, I'll want to have some time for that. Mr. Speaker, another program we have which I'm really excited about is what we call Arts in Public Spaces. And I know Miku North will be benefiting from that. I think you would have received your grant already. Um, again, Mr. Speaker, we have to promote art in public spaces. And the young people that are involved in visual arts, whatnot, um, this is an opportunity for them to find spaces in their community. Viewfort, the murals on the walls, at, at the, 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 the field in Viewfort, some other places. And I want you to encourage the young people in your constituencies to apply for the assistance where you could get the support to paint our, ourselves on, on spaces, our lives, our stories on spaces. And we will be making the monies available in Papunu, Viewfort North, Denry North. And I'm really excited about we doing so throughout the country, Mr. Speaker. And we have monies for, for this, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to move quickly as so well. I'll skip some of the other exciting programs. I was. Mr. Speaker, Carnival, Mr. Speaker. Remember last year when we said we were going to have Vax Mass? People said we were irresponsible, hundreds would die, 
that we should not do it, Mr. Speaker. But we, we fought, Mr. Speaker, and I, I discussed it with my colleagues, with the Prime Minister and colleagues in Cabinet, that the creative sector had suffered the most from COVID. The most. Why? Because creative people need to express themselves. They need crowds. They need audience. COVID restricted and denied an audience for them. So everybody was bottled up within their, their confined spaces. Creativity cannot flourish in such circumstances. It has to be unlocked. It must be given space, Mr. Speaker. And we wanted carnival to so be able for people to express themselves, the, the costume designers, the songwriters. We had to do it, Mr. Speaker. And we thought of how can we do it? We thought of Vax Mass. And then, of course, the Omicron virus came, which made it a little more, um, you know, accepting for people to gather and to be together. And eventually, Mr. Speaker, um, we did have carnival in this traditional way. And even when we said we were going to move from Vax Mass to traditional carnival, we were decried again. But we had a vision and a clear understanding of what we wanted to do. I remember the Minister of Health really working with us. You know, Mr. Speaker, I tormented him, Mr. Speaker, to get his ministry to, to make the adjustments to be able to accommodate us. And he balanced those two demands masterfully between I annoying him every morning and his technical people advising him how it should be done. I don't know how he survived that period, Mr. Speaker, but he will tell you I used to be at him regularly so it was a real difficult period for him, Mr. Speaker. But guess what happened? We had one of the best carnivals we ever had, Mr. Speaker. And we had 10,000 visitors that came in for carnival, making July 2022 our highest arrival month for the year, Mr. Speaker. And because of carnival... Sorry? Yeah, well, <laughs> the CFO was in carnival <laughs> order. But Mr. Speaker, so the government this year has given an extra million dollars for carnival. It's not enough. We still need more. Why we need more, Mr. Speaker? And I'm saying it loud and clear. So many of my colleague parliamentarians from Srozel all the way are talking about community carnivals. Now, if community carnivals have to be financed and supported, $1 million is not enough. Last year, we did not have Junior Panorama, Junior Carnival. There were so many other components we did not have. And $1 million, Mr. Speaker, is not enough. But it is what we have because the pie must be cut fairly and we'll have to make it work. But I'm saying to my colleagues to so be a little gentle on me that you won't get everything you need for your community carnivals, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I need to move on, so I'm going to jump to some of the capital project, Mr. Speaker. So I won't have a chance to speak about most of the other stuff, Mr. Speaker. Um, the, the ministry this year, Mr. Speaker, will be working really hard on certification and training. And, and I, I need you to understand why that's needed. If we're going to have a tourism industry that is world class, a tourism industry that has the highest standards, we have to train. We have to spend the money on certification. We train you and then we certify you where you can say that's the levels I have reached. So you demonstrate it and you proudly show that you've been certified. And we have, Mr. Speaker, made, we made a case to the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, that $20,000 for training was just not enough. Not when we want to build a world-class tourism product. Not when we want to ensure that our people can deliver the highest standards. And he agreed, Mr. Speaker. And he's now increased that from $20,000 to $450,000 for us to spend, Mr. Speaker, on, on training. So I'm really proud of this. The Tourism Hostess Program started by the Prime Minister when he was Minister of Tourism and the member for Vifort South, Mr. Speaker, was... Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, and they better than me can explain to you why such a program is important. And I will tell you, for those of you who may have forgotten, the entry of the member of the Miku South, a leader of the opposition into politics, was distinguished, well, into government, by the firing of the tourism hostesses. Remember that in Sufre? Yes. Yeah. Remember that? By firing them. Because from that day, he did not believe that the tourism hostess program is important. But it is important. 
by training people in the communities who are willing to welcome visitors to their community, to speak about the history of their community, the stories of their community, the struggles of their community, the aspirations of their community, the beauty of their community. That is valuable, Mr. Speaker. The visitors feel more welcome, they feel more connected, and the community feels it is part of the tourism experience, Mr. Speaker. Oh. How could you not support a community tourism program? So, Mr. Speaker, it will be brought back. Already we've done some training with the Taiwanese into storytelling techniques, because they do it in, in Taiwan, and we, they were down here, and decided to teach our people, our, our, teach, our trainers, about storytelling. How do you create stories about your community to be able to, Mr. Speaker? So, allocation is made for that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, under capital expenditure, Mr. Speaker, would you let me know when I have about 15 minutes left? So I can speak about cash. I have time? Okay. So, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> now it will start in a bit, Mr. Speaker, not just yet. Mr. Speaker, let, let, let's, look at, let, let's look at National Tourism Awards on page 590. Did you hear the member from Miku South last night? Did you hear him? No, I mean, Mr. Speaker, I, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker. Like he would stand up and ask, why would this government want to spend $150,000 on the tourism awards? And whether or not we could not go and get that money from the private sector instead, $150,000? Let me, let me first of all say to this honorable house that the tourism awards is being hosted in collaboration with two other agencies. The private sector, St. Lucia Boat Hospitality and Tourism Association, they contributing 150,000. The Tourism Authority, as the chief marketing agency, is contributing, and the ministry is contributing. So it is a joint collaboration. But it is important for us to have tourism awards. And Mr. Speaker, the tourism awards have been named the Jimmies. Now, do you know why the Jimmies? Mount Jimmy is the highest point in St. Lucia. It's the highest you can reach in St. Lucia. And by giving our tourism workers, those who have not been um, boasted of, those who have not been recognized, that we're giving you a Jimmy, the highest point of achievement in St. Lucia, is a powerful statement to them of our appreciation to them for the successes that this country has had, especially in the tourism industry. That we, we specifically name it the Jimmy's. So we name it the Jimmy's to say it's not only about the hoteliers being recognized and supported, they will be part of it too. But it's also about saying to St. Lucians that we appreciate what you're doing for the success of this country. How dare you criticize this and think that is a waste of money for us to do such a thing, Mr. Speaker. It reflects the thinking. It's the non-entity thinking, Mr. Speaker. It's the non-entity thinking that is not important for average, ordinary people to rise to the top. It's not important for you to say to people who in their own way contribute but if, you, if you're not of a certain standing, Mr. Speaker, you don't have a, you, you're not deserving of being recognized. So, Mr. Speaker, the Jimmy's will be held on April 26. And do you know what the theme is? Rethinking tourism. Because we have to rethink it. We have to put our people at the center of it, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on page 590, you will see an allocation of $558-750 for the National Cultural Center refurbishment. The National Cultural Center needs serious um, refurbishment. And I really hope, Mr. Speaker, and I'm saying it to the member from Castries East, can hear me, that we need to have a proper cultural center in St. Lucia. We need to have one. And a member from Jufa South will tell you Many years ago, when we were doing the projects, development projects with the Chinese, one of them was going to be a cultural center. And I know he had already identified and chosen land. I'm not sure if it had been acquired. He can let us know. In shock for the cultural, national cultural center. 
So we've had a long desire in the Labour Party to have a proper cultural centre in St. Lucia. And we must not let that dream fade away, Honourable Prime Minister. We will have to have a proper building that can host our archives, host our museum, and become a performance area for our creatives in this country. We have to do so. So whilst we, are, whilst we are repairing the cultural center, that dream must not die, Mr. Speaker. Community tourism, Mr. Speaker, on page 363. I spoke about the community tourism earlier on when I explained um, that this government cares. That is the reason why, Mr. Speaker, we are doing community tourism. And under, Mr. Speaker, the when I will deal with the policy, I will speak some more about the community tourism. But let me just say quickly, Mr. Speaker, that under the last government, they call it village tourism. And you know, just give me two minutes on my 30 minutes, Mr. Speaker. Let me just say something about this. Because the last government did not pass the legislation, did not put the institution in place, but they used all the money for the tourism program. They use all. They did not pass the legislation. They did not set up the institution to do it. But the monies were spent. I, some of them, I must tell you, in projects that I think were good, monies were invested in ancillary canneries, the bed and breakfast, um, the um, the restaurant. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, in the Ministry of Tourism area. But some went into putting lights in the Jack Melvin field. <laughs> I heard someone's given to Grozili. Um, I, I can't even tell you what it was used for. And I mean, it really missed the boat. This is an excellent idea. It is something that started when the Prime Minister was Minister of Tourism. The member from Vivot South will tell you of the vision of taking tourism to the people. We started heritage tourism. It continued and it continued. Huh? Exactly, it caught it Felix Finister, Mr. Speaker. And then we had the right meeting of idea, resources, and a lot of those resources, I believe, was not properly utilized. I support what is going on in Ancillary Canaries. I've spoken to the parliamentary rep about it, and you know, we've got to work to make it um, come to you know, completion. Again, because of the way it was done, there are issues. There's no money for sewer because we really cannot throw and treat sewer into the, the bay from the bed and breakfast and the restaurant. So we're going to find the money to, to complete the project. We're going to do more work in canneries. And the member from Answerway Canneries will tell you an entire market and restaurant will be done in canneries. Um, in Grosile, the Grosile, the beach park in Grosile will be done. I cannot give you figures because those have gone out for tender. And so I, it would make sense for me to tell you what's allocated for it for obvious reasons. Um, so we're going to continue that. But the good news is the Prime Minister, in discussion with him, said we need more money for more community projects. So he's spoken to the CARICOM Development Fund, and we're going to get another three million US dollars. And already we've started identifying some other possible projects. So the Mon Labai will be replaced, as you know, it's a, a real, you know, um, not an ISO, but also health hazard um, because it is moving. So we have to rebuild it. Um, we're going to build some performance center um, areas in Viewfort North, in Serenity Park. Um, even in, in Marsha, we're going to redo the Marsha market and to do something in there for community tourism. I know La Cleary has, a, has an interest. Um, there's a very exciting project that the church has submitted to us to put a shrine to commemorate the three persons who had been killed there and to create some religious tourism for cruise passengers when they come in. Um, Miku North will be getting a Seamoss experience. Um, then we south. Um, the fish fry had been allowed to just fade away in the last five years. It's going to be restored. So there are a number of projects we're looking at. Um, we now need to engage in the southern part of the island in terms of what it is that they, they want to present for our consideration. So we are constantly looking for more resources for us to uh, be able to, to spread the community tourism um, idea all over the island, Mr. Speaker. Um, hmm? Yeah, the amphitheaters in, there'll be two in Vieux Fort North and one. Now, under the OECS 
um, competitive tourism project, the RTCP, we have a number of, of activities, and I think $13.7 million is being provided, um, Mr. Speaker, for that. We will complete um, the project in Sruzel, it was mentioned by the, minister, by the representative of Sruzel, the craft market redevelopment, and that will happen, honorable member. Um, it has gone out for tender, so no figures will be put in there, um, as you can imagine. Um, the Castries market redevelopment will take place. We're building a container box park where the old marketing board building used to be that will add to the cruise tourism experience where people can go in and, and you know, have various um, offerings made to them, Mr. Speaker. Um, in Sufre, we're completing the Old Trafford project, so there'll be more concessionary booths built in Strozel for the... Um, the, for the Sufre, sorry, for the Old Trafford project. I think it's costing $667,000 to complete that project. Um, I think I mixed up Canar Canaries is actually under the ORTCP um, and not the community tourism. So, yeah, so, so it's going to be there. And of course, Mr. Speaker, we're going to be doing some work in Marigo in Castries South, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Marigo Bay Waterfront Redevelopment. I think all members in here will agree that Marigo is the most wonderful site for the setting sun. And maybe after the Peters is the most beautiful part of St. Lucia, Mr. 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 Speaker. And Marigo Bay Waterfront really needs some redevelopment. So we will be doing a redevelopment of Marigo Bay. And in the next two to three years, when you go to Marigo Bay, it will be a totally different experience. The beach on the other side, La Bas, an investor has already agreed to put one of the best beach bars in the Caribbean on that, reclaim the beach, restore it to its original size, and put a beach bar there for us. They're also in the process of acquiring lands to build a resort on the hillside, so we will have an entirely different Marigo. Um, the Marigo Bay project is going out to tender. We've done all the drawings, and we're getting ready to go out to tender um, for Marigo Bay, so that will be an exciting development. Um, when you pass the um, gas station on Millennium Highway, heading south on your right, there's a sharp corner called Asphere, the piece of mountain there. We'll be redeveloping that to create a lookout point. And I must tell you, based on the drawings, I'm really inspired to see this project come to fruition because it will be a sight to behold when we transform when we transform that area, Mr. Speaker, and offer greater opportunities to the people of Castro South, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, there is an issue in St. Lucia, or the honorable members. Um, Mr. Speaker, can you give me some protection, please? <laughs> so, Mr. Speaker, we have an interesting problem in St. Lucia. But it's a problem that when we solve it, will create tremendous possibilities. In the increase in the cruise arrivals again, there's a huge demand by cruise travelers who want beach experiences for the day. So right now, it's overcrowding taking place at Ridgery Beach and at VG. And they even going to Sufre now, and Chasne, whatnot, Pigeon Point, whatnot. So we need more beach parks. But when you create a beach park, hey, what are you doing? The beach boys rent a chair for 20 US a day, sometimes more. The guys who sell the Heineken, the Piton, the guys that sell the barbecue chicken, the roving vendors that sell stuff, make money. So we need to create more beach parks in St. Lucia. We don't have to crowd VG, Ridgery, Pigeon Point, but create more along the coast. So we've started identifying spots. Now, that's not new to us. That started from the last government. But the way they approach it was not structured in a more holistic way. They tried to do something in ancillary alone and not really look at all the possibilities. So we need to look at all the possibilities. And so we started doing that to look at all the different possibilities. One possibility that came readily to us, and that's why I'm disappointed with the last Minister of Tourism, because he skipped it, and then he went to answer it. Bakai has a beach park. Bakai. And for us, it's a natural, it's a, a low-hanging fruit. Let us 
upgrade it and can accommodate hundreds of cruise passengers there. I'll be speaking to Sufre. It is a Barron's Drive and Magnitude in that area. And we can create something for the guys from Barron's Drive and then to really run a beach park down in that area. So one of the provisions this year um, under the ORTCP is a Bakai Beach Park. We've done some drawings for it and we can upgrade it. And once we can resolve with Bakai, we will be able to, to execute that project. <coughs> The member from Strozel yesterday asked about training of the vendors that was part of the project. So that is provided for um, in this year's estimates again for us to start um, the training of, of vendors. And, and that, like I said earlier, training is really important for us. So we definitely will do so. Um, Mr. Speaker, you know, there is just so much going on. In, in, in tourism, Mr. Speaker, so much going on. Real, real, huh? real exciting stuff, Mr. Speaker. And when we, when we speak and in a policy session, <clears throat> the Prime Minister will make an announcement. Because the opposition has said a lot about GPH, and we sell the port, and we agree that there will not be any cruise port in Viewfort, and we move cruise from Castries to Viewfort. A lot, a lot of talk, 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 talk. Forgetting, forgetting that the discussions started with him. Yes. With him. And, <laughs> you know, in, in this business, as much as you want to criticize, sometimes you have the responsibility of government on your shoulder. So you are limited by what you can see. And I want to respect our private sector investors and not see some of what had gone on before. But St. Lucia should have had that project already. Should have had it already. But again, it's how the last government did their business. So we've come in and we've tried to correct some of the, the issues and to put it back on course. But hopefully, if all goes well, and cabinet agrees um, with the proposal because the negotiating team is still finalizing it, it will make a dramatic transformation of Sufre waterfront, the Bannans Bay area, and the entire waterfront by the government buildings because it's a really exciting project and hopefully by the policy statement time in the end of April, we would be in a position to release all the details of it. But I can say to you, Mr. Speaker, that when we do, we do make those announcements and execute this project, it would really, really add. And I'm already envisaging, you know, if you have the Banan Fisherman's Village, you have the, the, the boardwalk on the waterfront, you know, you have Anse Fair, you have Buckeye, you have Ancillary, you have Canaries, you have Soufre Waterfront. The whole coast starts to change, and you have the Grosile Beach Park. Um, well, yeah, yeah, these are possibilities as well. Um, th there's a lot. Hmm? Sandy Beach, well, that one is an issue that we need to have a discussion with because I think Invest did a development plan for that area and there are some very good ideas in it and we, we need to move forward. We are also still working very hard to get a cruise development in the south for home porting. That has been spoken about for a long time and I teased the member from Viewfort South once. I remember when we actually boarded a cruise ship in Viewfort because he too was from then trying to get cruise ships to come to, to, to Viewfort and, and I still remember that day you know, many, many years ago. And so it is something because we recognize most of the attractions are in the south. Are really in the south, you know, in Sozel, in Soufre, you know, Viewfort, whatnot. So so there's a lot that can happen and we can really transform, you know, the entire um, tourism industry. Now, Mr. Speaker, for the next few minutes, I want to say a bit about Castry South, Mr. Speaker. Um, <coughs> Now, Mr. Speaker, you would have heard members. What would you say to No, I asked that. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you would have heard members said that they've been advised to change Sigueyo to hold your secrets and, and don't say too much. So I'll be a little constrained by you know, how much I can say about Castro itself, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, I must express my sincere thanks in starting to the Prime Minister and to the member for Castries North, Mr. Speaker. I must. I stood in this house as a member of the opposition, and I called on the member from Castries North
to please repair the Bassa Joseph Road and the Marigo Road. Marigo attracts significant numbers of cruise tourists and overnight tourists. And the road could not continue to be in the state in which it was in. I spoke to him about the Bassa Joseph Road. Ever since that road was built, Mr. Speaker, almost 40 years ago, it had never been fixed, Mr. Speaker. Never. And I spoke to him about it in opposition, and he promised me that he was going to do something about it. He came into this honorable house in a budget debate, and he actually announced that they were going to repair the road in the financial year, and it never happened. I had to, Mr. Speaker, on two occasions, it was redirected to occasion to see a board being put up saying that the road reconstruction will start and it been taken down yes. two occasions i saw that mr speaker because remember you have 10 minutes left mr speaker okay that's fine i'll try to finish in 10. so mr speaker I, I know how he tried to make, the Honorable Member tried to get the roads fixed, Mr. Speaker. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that both the Marigo and Pastor Joseph roads have been fixed, Mr. Speaker, and totally reconstructed. And I must say to you, Honorable Member, the people love you. And the last time you came there, I saw you, you felt the love of the community of Bassa Joseph. They wanted to keep you, but I had to stop it, Mr. Speaker. But those roads, Mr. Speaker, and I started off by saying that Castries South is a special constituency. It was George Charles' constituency. And, well, Mr. <laughs> I would comment. <laughs> I, I know you from Mon Latok. That's where I knew you. Leave it. I didn't know you were Ambassador Joseph. But, but the point is, you know, it's really appreciated. It's really appreciated, Mr. Speaker. And we've gotten both the Marigo and Ambassador Joseph roads fixed, Mr. Speaker. I want to ask you, Honorable Member, to deal with some of the other roads. But I, I'm being reasonable. I know other colleagues also want their roads fixed. I got the two major roads in my constituency fixed. So I'm not going to pressure I, pressure you, Mr. Speaker, um, Honorable Member, but um, we do have other roads that need repair. I still get criticism that the Marigo Road was not completed all the way up to the bay, but at least if we can get some pothole in, um, a little, you know, a little tidying up of it. Um, up to two days ago, I got a text complaining about it, and there's some roads in Mar um, Cicera. You know, minor roads, just, you know, do some little works on it. I will inform the next wrong when I will get my major allocations um, for roads, but I'm very happy and satisfied. Mr. Speaker, Cicero playing field. You know, I came into this house. The previous rep, Robert Lewis, under the Labour Party, got approval to upgrade the Cicero playing field. It was stopped. I spoke to the then Minister of Sports from Denry South about just repairing, because it had been approved by NLA, to just restore it. I said, look, I'm going to get the lights. I'm going to get the, the pools, Mr. Speaker. I was not allowed to do it, and they would not have just restored the surface. The member from Grosley told me he would take care of it. And Mr. Speaker, it is being done now. And then, you know, it is being done now, Mr. Speaker. And in the next two months or so, it would have been totally surface and the grass grown, Mr. Speaker. And he has promised that we will also get the lights put in, Mr. Speaker. I'm also going to add to it, Mr. Speaker, an outdoor gym. I already have acquired the gym through the um, Diabetes and Hypertensive Society and the Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, they've provided the outdoor gym, so we'll have a complete outdoor gym in the corner of the field. We will get the lights, and hopefully here, some stands will be built in. Think about it, Mr. Speaker. Castries South does not have its, a playing field, a standard-sized playing field. We have the Marigo playing field, but it is mostly used by Jack Mel, Rozo, and um, what's the other side? Um, Country South is, you know, some of those other areas. Yeah, Mr. Speaker. So Cicera, which is one of the largest communities in St. Lucia, Cicera, cannot have a standard size playing field. But thanks to the member from Grosley, we will finally have a playing field, Mr. Speaker, that we can boast about, Mr. Speaker. So, so I'm, I'm really, really proud and happy for that. The Bassa Joseph Community Center, Mr. Speaker, 
the Pastor Joseph Community Center was started under the last Labour Party government, have built elections in 2016. It was stopped and nothing has happened since then. A contract was signed last month, a few days ago. But we're still in March, a few days, a few days ago, for the work to continue on the Bassett Joseph Community Center and for Bassett Joseph now to have a community center. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Castle South does not have any community centers except what we have in Fuashu. Think about that. The entire constituency, the entire constituency, the only community center we have is what we have upstairs, the public facility in Fuashu, which itself can barely fit, um, fit 30 people. That cannot be right. That cannot be right. And Mr. Speaker, I've told the Prime Minister, I will work the extra day. I will take the extra flight. I will do whatever I can to help raise the resources so Castry South can get a full, full complement of social facilities, Mr. Speaker. We will, during this year, continue on the Goodlands Road under the BNTF. It had been started again under the last Labour Party government, and it was stopped. It was stopped. So it's coming back again, and it will be continuing the road down by Madeleine, down to the bottom, all the way to the top of the George Charles, the former George Charles Secondary School, Mr. Speaker. From the top of the hill, where you, um, before, yeah, at the... At the where you put the, the barriers, the crash barriers and whatnot. Then, Mr. Speaker, we'll be doing some work at the Lacroix Combined School, putting in a classroom under the BNTF project, Mr. Speaker, and making sure um, that we, we provide the children with all that they, all that they need, Mr. Speaker. Um, we, we've, we've done a lot, Mr. Speaker, socially in the constituency, a lot. Um, the Back to School, Mr. Speaker, our Top Achievers program to honor the top performers in the common entrance, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Christmas program is a special thing for us in Castle South, where we give out our hampers to the elderly, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Mr. Speaker, we also have some creative programs. We have our black cake and sorrel competition, where we have a competition to see which, who can make the best black cake and make the best sorrel, Mr. Se Mr. Speaker. And it is for us an exciting time when we bring the community together, Mr. Speaker, to celebrate, um, Mr. Speaker, the, the community spirit and everything else, Mr. Speaker. Um, I spoke earlier about the school fees and the laptops. Castresoft really benefits from that. You know our constituency is one where there are few challenged communities and those programs, the medical bills, the funeral support, the food vouchers, the laptops, the school fees, Mr. Speaker, these make a difference. I know we're all concerned. We don't want people to become too dependent on government. But once we're providing training, we're creating opportunities, Mr. Speaker. We also want, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, we also want, Mr. Speaker, to be able to give them the support so people can enjoy some civilized living until they get the job, until they are able to acquire all the skills. They need to have some civilized living because if people cannot have any civilized living, they become social, you know, outcasts and deviants, Mr. Speaker. So it's not about, you know, um, creating dependency syndrome. We must avoid it. But we must also recognize people are human beings and they must be treated as such, Mr. Speaker. And the support for the schools, I've always helped myself out to support, Mr. Speaker, the schools. I know right now in Sufre we have island champs going on, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, the minister have left, Mr. Speaker, he stepped out, but to really say to him is a fantastic initiative that he is doing, Mr. Speaker, and I too hope that my schools can also benefit from that. But Mr. Speaker, in the minutes I have left, um, and until the Prime Minister comes, Mr. Speaker, you have to let me speak until he comes, uh, um, comes back in. What's the future? What, what's going to happen in Castle South, Mr. Speaker? I've said of all the things we're going to do, um, but you know, Mr. Speaker, Think about it. Cicero Community Center has been closed for almost seven years. It's small. It cannot serve a community of that size. The bottom is used as a daycare or preschool. The top is wooden, termite infested. 
and you have children downstairs, it is so badly, um, it has degenerated so badly, it's closed for years. You cannot not have a community center in Cicera. You cannot not have one. That just, that just cannot continue. And I've said to the Prime Minister, I will start the process of identifying a site, and I've done so, and to start the drawings and costings for us to have a proper community center in Cicera, Mr. Speaker. The community deserves it. The community deserves it. We cannot have the community with no community center. So Pastor Joseph will have one, Cicero will have one, and we'll have to fix for our show. In Marigo, under the last Labour Party government, again, under the CDB, we built a preschool, a learning centre, and the upstairs, which is supposed to be a community centre, has never been completed. Can you imagine how Castro South was treated? But that's going to stop. That is not going to continue. So we're going to do something about Marigo as well, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, Fuashu is a very special place to me, Mr. Speaker. And I remember growing up, Mr. Speaker, there was never any sporting facilities in the, in the community. Never. Think about it. Never have you can't a feeling for a show, a court. Under the last government, again under Dr. Anthony, we identify a piece of land. The EG is not there, but the, the piece of land is right next to his home. Well, this is where he used to live. He still visits there every day, though. We've acqui we acquired that land to put a court for Fuashu when Robert Lewis was a parliamentary rep. Well, Mr. Speaker, I've gotten the drawings for the court and the costing, and we will start the Fuashu court this year, Mr. Speaker. We will start it, Mr. Remember Speaker. Remember, you have to wrap Sorry? up. You have to wrap up. You want me to wrap up? Mr. Speaker, I have a lot more to say about the things we will be doing in Castro South, but I understand that we need to change the goal and we need to recognize, Mr. Speaker, that my time is up. But I can say to the people of Castro South, we promise we will transform Castro South. We promise that. A lot of work had started under the Robert Lewis that have not, what was not completed. It will be completed, and we will transform Castro South. Yeah, and then we will be, you know, Castro South proud of the representation that it has gotten, Mr. Speaker. Let me end, Mr. Speaker, by once again expressing my support to the Prime Minister for all the assistance he has given me as Minister and as Parliamentary Rep. Let me say thank you to all my colleagues in Cabinet. It's a real joy, Mr. Speaker, to work with this Cabinet of Ministers. I can tell you, it's a joy. There are those who have had a lot more experience and you can go to them and share ideas and get guidance from them. There are new ones than me who we talk a lot about where we're going, what we're doing, and it's a real camaraderie that we have, Mr. Speaker. And I enjoy one of my best days are Mondays to go to cabinet and to sit with my colleagues, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you it's a real delightful experience to go to cabinet on Mondays and for us to work together, Mr. Speaker. So I want to express my thanks to my colleagues and to um, the Prime Minister. I believe the budget which was, the estimates which was presented is what we need for these times. It really sought six to, to achieve multiple objectives. And I think the Minister of Finance, the member for Castries East, has gotten it right in terms of what he's planning to do. I just want Mr. Speaker to make one appeal, and I'm sure other members share it with me. Mr. Speaker, the medical care in this country, health care in this country, has to be placed at the top priority every day, Mr. Speaker. Persons who need um, sub, um, cancer patients, MRI, you know, just over and over, Mr. Speaker. It is overbearing, it's overwhelming, and we need to, Mr. Speaker. And it's one reason why I support what was presented wholeheartedly. When the Prime Minister said, this budget is about health care and security, I, I was one of the happiest persons because I know what we go through as parliamentary representatives, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward to its implementation. I will pay, play my part wholeheartedly and with determination to make sure we achieve our objectives for the year. Thank you very much.